I posted a video over a year ago about the RED Komodo and basically all RED cameras not technically having a native ISO. Now for as much pushback as that video gets, it also gets a ton of support. And so that mixed bag made me think maybe that old video uh, off the cuff vlog style was a tad confusing for some. So today I am revisiting this topic in a clear and concise way with a real world example. So I think we can all agree that ISO is just metadata. Therefore, when I think of the very definition of the word metadata, my brain says to me, okay, Justin, ISO doesn't matter. So without getting caught up in semantics, try to divorce your current thinking with everything I'm about to tell you. In other words, what I'm asking here is keep an open mind. And if at any point you get some spark of rage, I encourage you to save it until you've watched this video in its entirety. The phrase native ISO, as we've all come to understand it, that just doesn't apply to me when I am shooting in RAW. Now a camera manufacturer can certainly suggest some sort of ISO number as a starting off point, but when I'm shooting in RAW, native ISO as we know it just does not apply. ISO is simply a tool that I use to my advantage to preserve certain parts of the image. In other words, if you know how to utilize ISO, it can actually help you increase your dynamic range. And there is a real world example of this later on in this video, but I beg of you, do not skip ahead. Because first, there are some simple things that we need to break down. There are only three things that affect your exposure when you are shooting in RAW. They are aperture, shutter angle, and the available light. That is the triangle, folks. There is no ISO in the raw exposure triangle. And this is because, as I said a year ago, when shooting in RAW, all ISO speeds use the full potential of the sensor. I don't care if you're shooting at 200, 800, or friggin' 2000. When you are recording raw data to this little media card, all the ISO is doing is changing how the image is displayed on your monitor. Once you understand that, you can start utilizing the ISO setting to help you maximize the results of the scene that you are photographing. Because it is just metadata, and as such, it is only affecting the little LCD screen on the back of your camera. Because no matter where we put that ISO, the tonal range will remain identical on the raw data. However, what it will change on the display is the distribution of the stops above and below the midtones. So when you're sliding that ISO setting up and down, you're just shifting the mid-tone range on your monitor. You have to understand that it's not actually affecting the raw data that's being recorded to the media card. You are only affecting the image that is displayed on your monitor. That is how metadata works, folks. So once you understand that, you can start utilizing the ISO setting to help you preserve your shadows and or your highlights. Because once we start sliding that ISO up and down, it's going to force us to change the raw exposure triangle, whether it's aperture, shutter angle, or the available light. Now for most projects in the narrative world, your shutter and aperture are probably going to be locked in, which leaves you with only one thing that you can change that affects your exposure, the available light. So the best real world example for this is the classic front door scene. And luckily for all of us, I recently did one of those. You have one shot where camera is inside the house, looking out the open door towards the street. And then you have the turnaround of that where camera is outside the door looking in. I imagine all of you have shot a scene like this before. And if you have not, well, rest assured, you inevitably will. For the shot where camera is looking out towards the street, I already know I wanna preserve those highlights in the deep background. So what did I do? I set my ISO to 1250. This is going to change the way the image looks on my monitor. It makes me go, wow, it's way brighter out here now. What do I do next? I put more ND on the lens to protect those clipped areas. But now the background is not what the scene is about. I just want to make sure I'm not blown out back there. I want to protect that data. But the scene is about who's standing at the door. So now I need to protect those shadows on my talent's face, which have gotten darker because of the extra stops of ND. I need more available light to get proper exposure on the skin tones. So first thing I do is drop a little filter in the matte box, the award-winning Tiffin Ultracon. This is not a commercial, I just absolutely love this filter when shooting day exteriors. The Ultracon was literally designed to work off of all the ambient light around the camera lens, and it actually squeezes the waveform, 
Next, I need to get more light in on the actor's face. So we bounce the sun back in on the talent. And the best way to do that is to keep the bounce on the same side as the sun. So I've used the ISO to help me save that blown out background, as well as preserving the shadows on my talent's dark side. Ultimately, I've killed two birds with one stone. Because now when I go into post, I will have the most amount of detail that I could have possibly captured on the day. No part of my image was sacrificed. Okay, so now we gotta do the turnaround. Well, now I'm gonna work opposite because the inside of the house is much darker than what it looks behind me. So I drop the ISO down to 500. And now when I look at the monitor, I go, wow, it's even darker in here now. What do I gotta do? I gotta get more light in on the situation. So now I can lose those extra stops of ND and get some negative fill directly behind me because I don't wanna front light the actor because that would have zero contrast and I gotta get that sun wrap bounce off of camera, but keep it on the same side as the sun so I can maintain some sort of continuity and get that bounce in on the talent's key side. And then we can throw some light in the deep background of the house through a window on the outside. All of this to save the shadows, reduce any digital noise, but also maintaining continuity of exposure throughout the scene. And that is how I use ISO. And that's actually how most ASC members use ISO. If I was to go reshoot that scene today, but kept my ISO at the native 800, it would be a little more difficult to pull that sequence off because I wouldn't be utilizing the sensor to its full potential because it's two drastically different lighting situations within the same scene. A lower ISO when looking out at the street would make me put less ND on the lens. Then when I go into post, I'm like, whoa, this background looks crazy. Well, yeah, that's because I was worried about something called native ISO and I lost my highlights. Or worst case scenario, I kept the ISO at 800, I exposed for the background, and then now my talent is all super dark. So then you're fighting against yourself pretty much. You know what I mean? And then for an even worse case scenario on the turnaround, I didn't try to pump more level inside because my monitor was making me think I didn't need any more light level. Then in post, I'm going, wow, there's so much digital noise in these shadows when I try to lift the blacks. And that's because I wasn't using the ISO to help me protect those shadows. So I think of it like this. When shooting in RAW, ISO is like a little hack into making myself and my sensor think that I'm shooting at a different stop but I'm not. It's just a little trick that forces me to preserve as much data as possible in the image by changing the raw exposure triangle and ultimately helps increase the dynamic range. And I know I hear and read it all the time. People saying, oh man, those red sensors, they're so thirsty for light. And I disagree to that because I use this technique with the ISO. And I know it may be confusing because it's completely contradictory to what we've been taught or how we shoot on other cameras, but it's actually a very simple concept and a bit of a game changer of a workflow. And keep in mind, I did not make this shit up. I've learned this from cinematographers that are far more advanced than you or I. And I gotta tell you, there's a lot of DPs out there that are using ISO like this, which makes it that much more terrifying that I got so much pushback on that video last year. So in summary, the phrase native ISO does not apply to RAW. There can certainly be a suggested ISO, but to me, that means nothing. When the camera manufacturers came up with that number, they had no way of predicting what the whole world was going to be photographing. They don't need to know. So they just say, oh yeah, well, you know, in the warehouse testing, 800 seems to have the most optimal results. But that's in a warehouse, in a controlled test environment. It's not applicable to every single shooting situation that every DP in the world will ever find themselves in. It's almost the same as saying 5,000 Kelvin could possibly maybe technically be the native white balance for most digital sensors, but there are a thousand other factors involved that don't require you to lock your white balance in. And ISO is no different. And I'm using white balance as an example because we all know that white balance is just metadata as well. And ISO is the same way. The difference is the best results of your image are totally dependent on how you choose to use ISO when you are shooting in RAW. Now you all should know why I say there is no native ISO when it comes to shooting in RAW. All right, if you'd like to have more little nuggets like this, then this is the kind of stuff we talk about over on the Dog Times Patreon, as well as in our private Discord chat. Links are down below. The Dog Times Patreon is absolutely the number one way to support the show. It is a complete behind the scenes virtual journey on everything I do here in LA as a working freelancer within our filmmaking community. 
And for now, that is a wrap. Therefore, when I think about the very definition of the word metadata, what the fuck was that? Hi.